Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this very exciting track. Um, so I'm going to talk about the DHT reader privacy plan uh, in contrast to what uh, Masih was expecting or wanting. I'm not going to go into the details of how it works. It has been uh, detailed before in IPFS camp and IPFS thing last year. So we're just going to go through um, the what it is in a nutshell, the benefits, and then basically we're going to focus on this second part, which is the migration strategy, because what we're talking about here is a breaking change to the protocol, and therefore we need to, you know, uh, get some of these details uh, correctly. So with that, um, yeah, I'll start by saying that, you know, this has been called double hashing for quite some time now since, you know, the starting of the design that was uh, primarily masterminded by uh, Guillaume, which is the other uh, kind of presenter and author of the uh, presentation. And um, yeah, but the, the double hashing as a term might not be very accurate. So we might be kind of changing the name a little bit, but generally is a reader privacy upgrade, right? So it doesn't um, touch the writer, the publisher privacy of, um, yeah, the, uh, of the DHD. So in a nutshell, um, what we have is, uh, you know, traditionally we have the multi-hash, which simplistically is the hash of the content that you have. It's got some metadata, but anyway, let's say this is the hash uh, of the content. Then you have the CAD, which is the multi-hash with, um, with some more metadata. And then basically uh, what this double hashing approach says is that, you know, it's going to be the, the hash of a sort plus the multi-hash. Uh, so this is what included, is included in the latest spec, uh, and that's why it ended up, you know, uh, being called double hash because it's another, um, you know, another hashing step. Um, if you uh, if you want to learn all the details of how you go from uh, the hash of the content to the multi hash, then to the CAD, I definitely recommend watching this module on content addressing in APFS from the ResNet Lab on Tour tutorial. It's great, it gives all the details. Um, and then, of course, the double hashing part is not, is not included in there because it's very new. Now, the reader privacy upgrade, the approach, is actually three things. Um, the first one is that um, it's a CID agnostic DHD lookup, which is, um, yeah, uh, which is, which is different, um, which is different to what we do today, um, where the CID is in plain sight and everyone can see what CID is being requested. Then the second part is the fact that we, are, we can request, uh, we can do prefix requests, so not ask for the whole thing of what we want, but rather um, a subset of this, and I'm going to explain what this means in a minute. And then we have provider record encryption. So the provider record right now is in kind of plain sight again, but as like with this approach, it's going to be encrypted using the CID itself, right? So what is the benefits? Um, so the plain CID replay is not possible. Right now, if you're participating in the DHT as a DHT server, or if you're sniffing traffic in one way or the other, you can see uh, which CID is being requested. You can request it yourself, and then you can see who, like, you, you can associate the client, the requester, who is requesting the CID with the CID itself. So what content does this guy, you know, getting from the network? And also, who is it getting it from? So basically, everything is in the open. Now, uh, if we go to this approach, you can still replay the request uh, but you cannot read the provider record and therefore, because it's encrypted and therefore you cannot find out what the content that um, this guy is looking for, um, you know, what, what the guy is looking for, uh, basically. Um, the prefix requests that I just mentioned a couple of um, uh, slides ago, basically return several provider records because, you know, you're not asking um, for the whole thing, you're asking for a part, a prefix of the um, 
of the new hash, of the double hash, and therefore there might be several provider records that match this prefix only, right? Um, and therefore what you're going to get back is more provider records than the one that you're looking for. Uh, so through K anonymity rules, the, the intermediate DHT server or anyone else cannot know which, which thing exactly you're looking for because they're going to think, okay, this guy might be looking for one out of these 10 things that I'm, you know, are matching uh, my request. Uh, this is not making it impossible to figure out because you know, at some points that the hash space might be kind of more sparse and there could be more, uh, just one or a few uh, provide the records that match and therefore, you know, you don't have to choose, you don't have to guess out of a hundred, you might have to guess out of one or two, uh, which is not a hard guess, but still, uh, more often than not, and given that the network is growing in terms of um, volume of content, uh, it's going to make it much more difficult. And then we have uh, provider record uh, encryption, which, uh, as I said, is basically getting the provider record and encrypting it with the CAD um, itself. So therefore, you know, if you want to decrypt it, you can only decrypt it if you know the CAD itself. Um, and therefore, the, the intermediate DHC server cannot really, um, you know, associate the client requesting the record with the CAD, which is yeah, the, the, the kind of end goal for what we're doing here. Now, as I said, this is a breaking change and those changes are a little bit painful. They cannot just be included in a release because everyone who has not upgraded is going to be excluded uh, from that point on. So we need to have a migration plan and we need to get the vast majority of nodes to upgrade to the new DHT at once. And um, yeah, a question for the audience. Do you think, do you know why that might be a good goal for the migration plan? So no one is left out? Yes and no, yeah, that, that's uh, the m idealistic. All lookups break? No, all the, not all lookups will break. We're going to cover that, but this is definitely a requirement of the whole plan. Privacy. Sorry? Privacy. Uh, privacy, in what sense? Ah, right, yeah. Obviously, those that don't migrate, they're not going to be private because that's how things work now. Yeah, the answer is uh, due to security. So if you have a small fraction of nodes upgrading to the new scheme, then it's much easier to see build that network, right? And create fake identities and kind of take over the new network before the majority of nodes have upgraded. Yeah. So um, that's the goal. Uh, and the challenge is basically we need to make the date or the point in time that um, everyone migrates and upgrades to the new release, to the new scheme, common knowledge across everyone in the network. Uh, which is, of course, difficult to do because no one controls the software um, and it's difficult to, to do that at once. So that's where, where the migration plan is focusing on. And the summary of it is that, um, that the team, the IP stewards team and the probably team came up with, with help from others, of course, is to use an IPNS key that is going to be hard-coded in one of the Kubo releases, the one that is going to basically roll out the update, and um, orchestrate the nodes through this Kubo release to be requesting this key every so often, right? So um, as a clarification, everything in the next couple of slides that is uh, in red fonts is things we don't know and parts of the migration plan that we need to get in place. So the every so often, it could be every day or every week or every hour. Um, we don't know, we just, it's just uh, it's a detail that we need to kind of iron out. Um, so that's how if every day, um, you know, if there is an IPNS key that um, includes, um, simplistically could include a, a Boolean like uh, true or false or a date, then everyone that is, you know, pulling this IPNS record daily, 
they will, and checking the field that we want them to check, they're going to know, you know, this is the date or this has turned to true now, so it should go and upgrade, right? Um, this, um, uh, the migration date, of course, it needs to now be the, setting the date in this APNS key or the Boolean if it's true or false uh, to true, you know, um, to the right value needs to happen when enough peers have upgraded to uh, to this release. So this will need to um, monitor, which we do through our crawler, uh, and we are going to be able to see when you know enough peers. I don't know what enough might mean. 50% of the network, 70, 30, I don't know, we'll, we'll have to figure that out. Um, now, on that migration date, uh, we have different peers and kind of peer categories that need to follow their migration strategy. And by this, um, yeah, okay, uh, by, by every peer, I mean DHC clients, DHC servers, uh, content providers, you know, uh, all these different kind of network players, which I'm going to mention in a minute and go in detail in a minute. Um, a couple of other of uh, a couple of other of um, other parameters is the switch date. Uh, so this is when we're going to see that, you know, enough peers, as I said, have upgraded. Um, and we think that we are now ready to do the switch, that the date is going to be fixed. And the transition period, which is something quite important, you know, um, the period of time when peers in the network will have the opportunity to use both DHTs. So uh, it's going to be a, a little bit risky to just deprecate the old one just right at once because I don't think, we don't think that, you know, everyone is going to be in front of their laptop to do the upgrade uh, at a specific moment. So there needs to be some period there. And the exact period, um, yeah, it, it's relatively tricky to set, but we need to get to that. Uh, now, during the transition period, and this is where we get into each DHT key DHT player, we have the bootstrappers that are, of course, key part of the DHT network, uh, still, maybe not in the future, but they are now. Uh, they should be providing peer IDs for both the new and the old DHT, so that, you know, a new, uh, a new DHT client or server getting into the network and wanting to connect to others, they know that they have peers to connect to. So that's the easy part. These are a few, uh, they're currently controlled by EPL, so uh, it's not easy to set that there. Now the content providers, especially the big ones, um, by default, they should switch to the new DHT on that transition date. Um, they do have the option to stay in the old DHT and keep on providing their content, um, but they will have to do so kind of manually to touch um, uh, either choose the right option in the APNS key or their own um, their own code base that they're running on their machines. Now you you can understand that you know there is there is one system that is running now and there is going to be a new one. If you're providing content and you switch to the new one um, and you only provide there, you know, and your clients have not upgraded, so they're they're on the old system, operating on the old system, so to speak, your content is going to be unavailable, unreachable, which is not great. Um, yeah. Um, how are you going to measure how many, how many nodes have migrated and who's still needs to migrate and what percentage of, oh, sorry. How are you going to measure how many nodes have migrated, how many um, clients are operating on the new system so you can figure out when you can make the later transitions and the deprecations? Right, so uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the DHT clients are, um, I think, easy to have, um, like it's difficult to have an idea of how many DHT clients have upgraded, right? Because th this is not something we can crawl, this is not something that we're monitoring. Um, but this is easier with clients, and this brings me to the other point. You know, they can easily make two requests, one to the new DHT and one to the old DHT to cover the case where some content provider might not have upgraded yet, right? Of course, this adds, you know, twice the number of requests to the two networks now, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, it, it, it will add some more traffic to the network, um, but it can, 
like, you know, they can prioritize to ask the new DHT first, not have two requests going out at once, so that if the content providers, which should hopefully upgrade right there uh, on the switch date, then they're going to get their content right from the first request and not have to go to the second. Um, yeah, and then the DHT servers, um, which is the intermediate nodes in the network that you know, respond to requests for provider records, they might have to run both DHTs for a period of time um, until the old DHT is deprecated. Uh, of course, this adds more, you know, uh, more requirements to the DHC servers because they will need to um, keep provide the records for the old and the new DHT um, and serve requests for both. So, you know, uh, some the traffic is going to be uh, increased as well there. Um, yeah, so this is uh, that's it for the key DHT players. Any questions? up to this point. Okay, no, so everything is understood. Excellent. Right, so, <laughs> so, uh, so the timeline, uh, where we are today and where we're going to get to, okay. Um, yeah, so the spec is finalized or it's very close to being, fi to being finalized. So we expect only minor updates if there are any. Then um, the first plan of the uh, draft of the migration plan is what I'm presenting right now. And we also have um, a discussion forum post which went out on um, yeah the day before yesterday. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Then um, at the end of this month, we want to have, you know, we want to receive feedback from the community in the discussion forum, from you here, and from, um, we're going to, of course, meet with the team with the opportunity that um, we're all here together. And um, yeah, make more progress as to when things are going to be ready. So the announcement is going to be in the form of um, a blog post uh, and, you know, relevant comes to the community. Then um, the next steps, which are subject to change, and that's why they're pretty kind of broad dated there, is um, finishing the implementation and the testing, which is going to be uh, hopefully within Q2 of this year. And then um, most likely towards the beginning of, um, of Q3 of this year, we're going to have a migration plan finalized if things need to change. Uh, we're going to have the Kubo release that is going to go out and it's going to include both, you know, both of the two new DHTs, the refactored DHT code, so to speak. Uh, and then at some point, when we see that enough peers have upgraded, there is going to be the migration triggered and then it's going to be completed after the transition period has finished. Um, so yeah, that's the timeline to uh, migration. Admittedly, it, we don't have set dates yet, but look out for updates in um, in this discussion forum blog post. Uh, sorry, in this discussion forum post, where which is going to serve basically as the point of reference for anything that we do. So we're going to be posting updates there. Uh, as I said, there might be a blog post, but we're also going to post it here. So if you're interested, just follow that. Um, and the, the, you know, how to reach out to the team is the usual uh, suspects through the IPFS Discord server. There is a libp2p-privacy channel there, uh, but you can also uh, reach out to libp2p-implementers and ProBlab, um, and most of these channels are also findable in the file going Slack. Um, there is a working group session scheduled on this topic to make some more progress and hopefully, you know, get to define the parameters that I put with, um, you know, uh, in red, the slides before, the transition period, um, how often the IPNS key should be fetched by um, all of the nodes in the network and all those unknowns right now. Uh, hopefully we can get some answers. So uh, if you're interested, I think that is scheduled for Wednesday. Um, so in three days from now, uh, if you're interested, just reach out to me and, um, yeah, we'll be in one of the rooms on this, on this floor. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, as pointers now, the spec is a source of truth, uh, as I mentioned previously. If you want to know the details, just get to that. There is, you know, there has been, it's IPIP373. There has been lots of good discussion there. You see lots of uh, comments, lots of commits, lots of uh, revisions. Uh, so if you want all the detail, that's the place to go. And Guillaume has given some very nice talks, as I said, in IPFS Camp and IPFS Thing last year. So these might contain a bit of out-of-date info, but um, mostly if you're interested in the basics of how things work and why they work this way, uh, I think they're still um, valid. Um, yeah, and that's it. Any questions and what should we explain better? Uh, this might be in the details, so feel free to reject this question. That's um, why I have Guillaume there. But could you speak a little more to uh, the threat model, maybe of uh, of the uh, content privacy? It just Because I'm thinking, for example, if somebody knew upfront certain content IDs that they wanted to track or block, it seems like they could trivially decrypt the uh, yeah. provider records. Yeah. So, so the main um, threat model here is that we don't want anyone in the network to uh, be able to observe, you know, traffic, CADs, who is requesting what, and who is serving the thing that has been requested. Uh, so that's why it's called reader privacy. Indeed, if someone has got the CAD, then things are becoming a lot easier. Um, but in the general case, uh, we want to primarily avoid the, um, you know, those that sniff traffic from the network and can build kind of dictionaries of, you know, what happened at which point. Any other input from Guillermo? Yeah. Yeah, so I would say the privacy of the request highly depends on the secrecy of the CAD, which means that if I'm sharing with you my holiday pictures and they are not publicly addressed on the web, then it's going to be totally private. But if you're trying to access to, I don't know, a, a Wikipedia page that is very popular, then DHT servers that know this um, very specific CID will know that you access it. So for very public data, it doesn't give much privacy, but for, let's say, more private data, it is able to provide privacy. Uh, what about the flip side? What, what solutions can you think of in terms of blocking specific CIDs, for example? Because if, if, if all the CIDs are, are encrypted, if you want to remove some you know, un, uh, unsavory uh, CID, how would we go about doing that with the reader privacy? So someone like, you'd have to know the CID, right? Uh, kind of similar to today, you um, you have to know the CAD of some bad content that you might not want to serve from the network. So as soon as you know that through some out of band means, then, um, then you can do the same as you do today, I think. That's right. I guess what I was getting at is getting to know that CID is now more difficult because if, if there is like a specific circle in the system and that you know distribute content that we don't want them to as long as they don't leak the CIDs themselves we would never know what those CIDs that are being looked up right from from yeah. outside perspective yeah but uh, but you cannot read yeah correct but you cannot you or no one else unless they know the CID um, can decrypt or see what's in the content. So everything is encrypted. So that's why, yeah, so um, r right now, if you have a CAD that might fall into the hands of someone that you know should not look at it, they can look at it. Then this is not going to be possible unless you explicitly want them to figure, to know what the CAD is. Yeah, basically it's just, I think if you have a blacklist of second hash, to block then it's easy to block and otherwise it's just you cannot block the content routing of something you don't know what it is yeah migration plan have you thought <clears throat> in terms of has there been any consideration and now that we have this pluggable um, content routing layer that instead of running like 
the old DHT version, it would like fall back towards IP and I, for example, so you don't have to have this duplicate logic and maintain that and just do a clear upgrade or yeah, so, so this is part, so the fact that the IP9 now exists, um, there is a full back option, and therefore the transition period running both DHTs might not even be needed. That's what you're saying. Yeah, that, yeah, that's correct, that's correct. And we're taking that into account that, you know, CID.contact is now part of Kubo, and I guess that it's not going to be removed, I don't know, I don't know when or if ever, but by the point we get there, which is going to be in a few months, uh, it should still be there. So yeah, we're taking that into account. It might help. Yeah. And, and maybe a follow-up for testing. What's the plan for testing if, uh, yeah, I guess just testing that it'll work in, in production before rolling out 100%. Yeah, so, so what can happen is that we can, um, as I said, there is going to be a new Kubo release out, right? But it's not, it's not going to be triggered, the migration is not going to be triggered directly. So during that point, we, can, we will have the option to test it by, you know, kind of on purpose migrating our own private cluster machines to interact with the public network, but at the same time, do all the double hashing logic. So of course, we're going to have tests beforehand, but there's going to be kind of live tests when our machines have migrated, but not everyone else is. With any kind of privacy improvement, like one of the challenges is how do you explain the limitations of it yeah. um, and the benefits of it to, well, you have kind of a lay audience, but, but, but also you have an audience, I, I think at, at we support at the foundation a bunch of very privacy conscious sort of use cases. And I think that they're, they have a, a, a very good understanding of kind of a web two uh, threat model um, and less of a, in a decentralized way, just, just through experience. So I'm sort of trying to work out how I would explain the change here. Um, it strikes me that one of the ways we could explain it is by talking about the steps that have been taken to protect DNS lookups, right? So there has been a whole sort of debate about DOH and like how, you know, how DNS lookups are actually um, uh, plain text and have been for, for a while and the movement to that. Is that a useful analogy? Can you think of another one if I'm explaining it, not to a lay person so much, but someone who is used to a traditional uh, uh, web security model or internet security model? Maybe an abstraction we could have concerning this um, is that um, we would use a different content identifier for content routing and for data transfer, which means that uh, now we have the CID, which is kind of the master content identifier, and now we'll hash it with a specific hash, which will give us the um, um, content routing um, identifier. But then once you know where the content is located, you need to derive a new content identifier. So for instance, you hash the CID with another salt, and then you will request the content using this other name. And so it means that even if you were, if you observe, if you sniff some traffic in the content routing system, you wouldn't get the um, data transfer name for this specific uh, file and you wouldn't be able to fetch it. So that's like more changing around the namespace. If that Does answer your, answer question. your question, or is it not? Uh, it gives no. more fuel yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, an analogy that just comes to mind now. So I don't know if even if it's um, too accurate, could be you know um, we have the DNS system where you're asking for some URL through the browser, um, but then you have services such as the ones that are making the URL shorter. So basically, that's an identifier of something that I cannot understand what it is. I might have a, 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 you know, an intuition if I've used it before that you know, three letters stand for, I don't know, some website normally. But otherwise, I'm asking for something that I don't know. And therefore, if everyone else on the path sniffs my traffic, of, of course, the DNS server will know what to do, right? But everyone else that is just 
sniffing my traffic from, say, my Wi-Fi access point will not know now what I'm requesting. I think probably what we have to do is to spell out some threat models that people are familiar with and go, yeah, okay, how does this how does this change what the capabilities of an attacker have? Because definitely. like if someone's tracking your yeah 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 we'll definitely we're, we're we're going to have very clear communication um, yeah through written but both you know in some form of video recording of you know, what can be done and what cannot be done from now on. And we've got a threat model section on the spec. Um, just to sort of follow up on Danny's question and the earlier question about threat models, um, to make sure I'm understanding this correctly when I communicate with some of those project partners and activist organizations. Um, NSA style, style mass snooping has now become very difficult uh, with this new change, but if there's a particular, like high-profile CID with that's known to the ecosystem, mm -hmm. this does not prevent um, uh, somebody from figuring out exactly who is requesting that CID, and they could even, if there was a list of those resources, still do a mass surveillance program on that full list to see who is accessing those resources? Yeah, correct. Okay. As long as you have um, the HT server located at the right places in the in the source space. I mean, there are, there are optimizations there as well that can be done in the future, but I think they will be based on this base model, like, you know, changing the salt and doing things like that. Uh, I think are optimizations that we can think of as a second step to to avoid that case as well. But yeah, what you're saying is basically valid. Uh, would those optimizations or whatever future change would they also require an expensive? No, I don't think upgrade so. Upgrade like this? I don't think okay. so. No. Thank you very much. If you're interested, reach out and let's uh, have a session separately uh, later on this week. Okay.